My name is Eleonora and I'm the co-chair of the Child Protection and Cash Task Force together with my colleague Miret from World Vision and I'm from IRC. So just a few minutes of introduction before we dive into this presentation. The Child Protection and Cash Task Force started in 2018 under the Alliance of the Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Currently, the task force is co-led by IRC and World Vision, so myself from IRC and Mirad from World Vision, and we have over 50 members. Earlier this year, we reached out to the members to see who had good example and lesson learned and project that they want to share with the wider community. And so we're very glad that Save the Children is in our first webinar series. And in particular, I'm going to introduce to you the main speakers who will lead us through this presentation. The first one is Julia. Julia is the Emergency Food Security and Livelihood Senior Specialist at Save the Children US. She has eight years experience in supporting cash and voucher programming for Save the Children in the Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. And more specifically, over the past two years, Julia has been backstopping Save the Children response in Venezuela, and notably she has been involved in the design and in the implementation of this project. The second speaker is Niall Jean-Baptiste. He's a meal senior specialist at Save the Children, focusing mostly on cash and voucher assistance and food security and livelihood programs. And he as well, over the past two years, he has been supporting Save the Children in Colombia, their program, and notably he participated as well in the, in the implementation and the design of this uh, project that they will present to us. Thank you very much, Leonora. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to start this presentation. So just a background. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the Colombia context, given that I'm seeing that we have a lot of people from different places in the world. Colombia is the primary hosting country of Venezuelan migrants and refugees. When we were implementing the project, we had approximately an estimated number of 1.4 million Venezuelans that were in country now this number went up to estimated 1.7. On a daily basis, there were over 5,000 people that were crossing the border from Venezuela into Colombia. Some were aiming at staying in Colombia, others were doing back and forth between Colombia and Venezuela uh, for those that were living in bordering region in Venezuela. Those are called pendulares. And we had a third group that is called caminantes, who are people who are crossing through Colombia very often by foot to go to other countries such as Ecuador, Peru, Chile. When they arrive in country in Colombia, Venezuela migrants arrive in a context that is extremely complex. Colombia has been suffering from a lot of different conflicts in the past two years and for displacement. So they arrive in an already pretty complex complicated and, and vulnerable context. Before designing this project, we've run various needs assessments in collaboration with the CCD, and we found extremely high needs, particularly in food security and nutrition. A shelter, because basically people arrive and they don't have anywhere to stay, they don't have money to buy food, to buy anything, they left everything in Venezuela. There are subsequently a lot of problems that are related to protection and child protection, notably through the use of very negative and harmful coping strategies and also obviously some needs in WASH. So to respond to these needs, we started this multipurpose cash transfer program integrated to nutrition and education. So the program was implemented on the border with Venezuela in two areas called Arauca and La Guajira. Initially, we were planning to operate in urban areas within those regions, but then and we've realized when we started the project that there were informal settlements that were the border that were in extremely high needs. So we decided to target those areas. The program was composed of three main components. The first one was MPCA transfers that targeted over 13,000 Venezuelans and vulnerable Colombians, including Colombians' IDPs. They received three months of multipurpose cash transfer assistance, as well as two months of cash transfer assistance that was smaller in amount that was designed to only cover basic food needs. In complement to this, in the same areas where a beneficiary received MPC assistance, we have implemented nutrition activities, more specifically IYCF activities, running workshop and providing dedicated counseling to mother and to pregnant and lactating mothers as well as fathers. 
And we also implemented some child protection activities, notably through the provision of psychosocial support through the setup of child-friendly spaces, case management, and community mobilization activities. The cash transfer value was calculated to cover the most basic and urgent needs of Venezuelans. So it covered the cost of a minimum food basket that was harmonized with WDFP. It also covered the cost of minimum rent as the program was initially designed to be in urban areas to avoid that people would be living in the street as most vulnerable Venezuelans that don't receive assistance currently are. Also to cover the minimum cost of hygiene products for family and also for babies. We had dedicated baby kits transportation as well as sleeping kits and cooking kits. The reason why we decided to include those is as I've mentioned people arrive without nothing so they need to have basic support to purchase equipment to sleep, to cook and to start up their new life. So in order to identify beneficiary we've relied on three main strategies. The first one was a blanket screening of informal settlements where we went basically door to door within the informal settlements and were screening beneficiaries. The other one was referral from external organizations. So we developed a series of MOUs with different NGOs that are either specialized like Medicare or non-specialized, as well as governmental institutions. And we also set up uh, internal referral systems with our other programs of child protection, nutrition, and health. To speak a little bit more about the internal referral systems, our MPCA team, so the cash teams, were trained in child safeguarding and identification of potential cases of child protection, potential cases of children at risk. They were trained by our child protection team to identify uh, alarm signals, such as aggressive behavior towards other children, fear of physical contact, constant silence, alarm signs that were identified by our child protection team. And once those signs were identified, the MPCA teams were referring those potential cases to a case management team so that a, a social worker could, could be assigned. Now, outside of the internal referral mechanisms, once beneficiaries were identified, we were applying a selection survey. So the selection survey was developed around a scoring. It included the RC, reduced coping strategy index score, as well as other proxy socioeconomic vulnerability indicators that were looking, for example, at single-headed household, woman-headed household, or presence of PLWs within the household. Also looking at dependency ratios, so looking at number of children, number of children under two, elderly or disabled household members, housing the conditions and a level of income as well. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the impact of the project. Nile, over to you. All right. Thank you, Julia. Before starting talking about the impact of the project, we wanted to present you the profile of the beneficiary to better understand the impact of this project and what were our beneficiaries. So as you can see in the slide, Two-thirds of children, we found our beneficiary household, roughly 60% has at least one children on the five, 35% with children on the two years old, and 11% had at least uh, a children between zero and six months. In terms of dependent, we found that 40% of uh, the household who were uh, enrolled in this project had at least one elder, elderly uh, person, and Amazingly, 42% had at least one disabled or clinical ill person. 24% had no income at all. And a large amount of household were more food insecure. And the chart here is basically the relation we have found in terms of the household size and food insecurity situation when we're looking at the coping strategy index. And this chart is just telling you that the greater is the household size, more food insecure the household is. And you can see, for example, an household with nine and more people has an FCSI of 40 points. Um, greater is the point, greater um, food insecure the household is. So that was a really um, great um, finding that we were able um, to find. And this slide is just put the context in terms of who we work with. In terms of um, the use of cash, we try to track the use of cash using the perception of the beneficiary, but also looking at the exponential pattern. And we found that 35% of the household that we survey say that the food security has improved. 31% on the shelter situation has improved, and 28% 
of the household I mentioned to us that um, they have improved the, the, health, uh, the, the health situation. But in terms of expenditure pattern, as Julia mentioned, um, the purpose of the, the cash transfer was mainly to provide the household a means to buy food. And when we track the beneficiary through our monthly post distribution monitoring and baseline and final evaluation, we found that 9% nine, nine of the household mentioned that they use the cash transfer to buy food. And this slide also is showing us that 41% also use cash transfer for hygiene and 33% use the cash that we have provided for education, either for paying some school fee for children to buy um, educational materials. So, um, and that was a really great finding that not only people are using cash transfer for food, but also for other patterns like health, hygiene, and mostly education. In terms of impact on food security indicators, and also in the next slide, we'll talk about the impact on nutrition, health, and also on the child protection. But this slide is basically telling you what we have observed at the beginning, before the project, and after the project. And one of the indicators that we have tracked in this project is the household on the scale. And as you can see, we had at the beginning of the project around 72% of our household enrolled in the project who were either in moderate or severe hunger. And at the end of the project, when we conduct the final evaluation, we had only 10% who said that they were in a moderate anger, which is an amazing impact that we had in terms of food security for the household. Uh, the second indicator that we tracked um, for the food security aspect is the coping strategy index. And this is a key indicator because the coping strategy index is basically telling you what households are doing when they don't have cash or money to buy food or to access food. And at the beginning of the project, we calculated the RCSI. We asked questions uh, during the baseline about the RCSI. And when we relate the level of coping strategy index to the integrated phase classification, which is uh, the IPCU, which is an indicator commonly agreed to classify the vulnerability of, of, of a household, we found that close to 80% of the households that were enrolled in this project were either in crisis emergency or in a catastrophic situation. At the end of the project, when we redo the survey, we found that 80% were in a non um, situation. So that means only very few people, around five, 6% said they, they were in a crisis, an emergency and catastrophe. These two indicators, FCSI and HHS, is uh, uh, really um, uh, testimonies telling us that you know, cash transfer has really improved the food security uh, of the household that we supported in this program. Talking about WASH, we tracked two types of indicators. The first one is the access to adequate water uh, as defined by the sphere and national standard. And here at the baseline, as you can see, the percentage of household who had access to water was around 23%. But at the end line, it was we recorded 39%, roughly 40%. Um, one of the, uh, and so we did not make a lot of change um, in terms of access to, to water. And the reason why we, we have this low level of achievement is because, as Julia explained at the be beginning of the project, we are planning to work in urban and formal settlement. But uh, between the time that we wrote and submitted the proposal and, uh, and the time that we started to implementation, implementation the dynamic has changed and we've found ourselves with a lot of informal settlement, not in the urban area. In informal settlement, precisely where there is no infrastructure that would allow us to make an intervention in terms of water and provision. So that means, and this is one of the lessons that we have learned is that when we, we are doing a cash transfer intervention and you have a component of wash, cash will not help you if you are dealing with really informal settlement when there when there is no infrastructure to allow the provision of, of water and even though you have a market-based approach if water infrastructure is not available even if you're distributing or you're providing cash you will not see a lot of changes in terms of access to water 
However, because we we had collaborated with other NGOs and stakeholders in the region, we were able to have a lot, much better achievement in terms of wash non-food item. And as you can see, we, we were able to move 10% to 55% of the household who said that they have access to wash non-food MFI items. Again, we also tracked some indicators around access to shelter. And you can see we did a major um, improvement for the household who were enrolled in this project. And this slide is just telling us that the percentage of beneficiary household who, whose shelter solutions meet a grid technical and performance standard went from 22% to 63% from the baseline to the end line, as well as the percentage of the beneficiary household who reported adequate access to wash non-food item, NFI, went from 35% to 58, roughly 58% in terms of improvement. In terms of nutrition, we tracked two main indicators, exclusive breastfeeding and consumption of uh, four or more food groups. Here, you can see that we roughly, for the, from the baseline to the end line, we were able to double the, the achievement. And for example, you can see at the beginning of the project, we had 10, 23 children between zero and five months who were exclusively breastfed. And at the end of the program, this indicator was at, we call it was 46%, which is a major achievement in terms of exclusive breastfeeding. Now for the child protection, we did not have um, in our indicator tracking table, you know, specific impact indicators, but we work with the caseworker to evaluate the impact of the cash on the well-being of the children and the, and the child protection, and also to tr track the child protection outcome. And why we did that, and as Julia mentioned earlier, is we, our referral system was based on external actors, but also within our own way of working. Because Save the Children, we have child protection team, so we integrate the, we integrate the child protection team within the project. And we ask them to go back in the list of beneficiaries who were selected and who were referred by the child protection team and we're able to track some specific um, information and impact. For example, we were able to reunite 20 families, and we have, we have eight cases where we reduced the child um, labor. And for example, we, were, we had um, um, one case where we were able to reduce the risk of recruitment for the group, and seven cases were treated for reducing the risk of physical, physical violence. And 27 cases were recorded and treated for reducing the risk of negligence. And in order to better understand the achievement in terms of child protection, we use also some indicators recommended by the islands for child protection study. And I think recently the islands produced in, in June 2019, where they discussed the integration between child protection and cash programming and they made some suggestions in, in terms of indicator that we could include. So we use that document to, to gather some information from the child protection team. For example, you can see one of the um, indicators that we were able to get information is we found that 100% of our food and security livelihood program in, in the targeted area included an integrated approach to child protection. And we had 30 identified child protection cases were referred by the food security and livelihood and cash staff to the child protection case management staff. And all our staff, including you know, the meal and the food security and livelihood cash, were trained and assigned to a child safeguarding policy. So those are the, uh, some of the indicators recommended by the Alliance last year that we took and we Came back to the child protection team and asked them to make the relation to see where we stand in terms of this indicator. This is the rest of the indicator that we included in our list of indicators for child protection. I will not go uh, one by one, but one that is captured in my mind is the percentage of parents who are reporting an improvement in the well being of their child thanks to the program. This number is 63. And this is a really key impact indicator that we were able to the child protection team to, to track. So 63% of the parents who 
were part of the child protection targeting household and who were also part of our multi-purpose cash um, transfer program revealed that they have seen an improvement in the well-being of their child. These are the kind of, you, you can see, for example, we have 100% of our male staff were trained in the identification and the potential of children, at least in the child safeguarding. And why we insisted for all our male staff to be trained is because, as Julia explained, our referral system is, is using the child safeguarding group inside Save the Children. So to ensure a great collaboration between male same monitoring and evaluation team and the child protection, we had to train all of them in the identification of children at risk and in child safeguard. We wanted to present you. So I'll turn over to Julia so she can talk on the recommendations. In terms of challenges, solutions, and lessons learned around child protection, so I guess from the analysis of the impact that Nile just presented, you can observe that there was a crucial lack of indication around which type of indicators we needed to use since the beginning of the program. And that doesn't really enable us to measure the real impact that a multiple cash can have. The guidance that was published at the end of the program, and we're now starting a pilot around this to test some of those indicators with the Alliance. But unfortunately, all of the findings are most qualitative or were collected afterwards with the recommended indicators. I guess one of the key recommendations moving forward is obviously to integrate the recommended indicators to any future multi-purpose cash transfer program, regardless of whether they, it, the program is integrating child protection or not. This will really, really enable us as cash practitioners to better measure the impact that cash can have on protection. Another uh, recommendation is obviously to, whenever possible, whenever you implement a multi-purpose cash transfer program and child protection activities, to integrate them not just in terms of geographical locations, but also to integrate them by setting up those internal referral systems between the child protection team and the multi-purpose cash teams. I think it should also be mentioned here that the referrals were not just from from the cash team to the case management team, but also the other way around. Something else that the case management team has developed, which you can find inside the, the written report of the case study, is a prioritization tool that was being used by case workers throughout the case management that helped families to better think through that were receiving cash transfer, to better think through how this cash could best benefit their child. Also, another recommendation is once the multi-purpose cash transfer finishes and the case management as well, well, we're not really sure about what happened. So as much as possible, it's recommended to link those beneficiaries with uh, livelihood schemes so that all of the benefits occur during the, the program, both the MPCA and the case management can be maintained. So on the nutrition, as Nail mentioned, we saw that a very, very positive impact on, on the household food security, as well as children between 6 and 23 months, dietary diversity. However, we don't have a lot of information about to measure really the impact on pregnant and lactating women. So in the future, it's recommended for multi-purpose cash transfer program integrated to nutrition to consider first the specifically kilocalories requirement and micronutrients need of pregnant and lactating women when this designing the food baskets. Those can vary significantly from standard food, food baskets. Also, another recommendation is to include individual indicators of food security and nutrition, specifically for pregnant lactating women, in order to better measure the impact of the cash and nutritional status and food security. One of the recommendations is also to include some additional indicators for children between 6 and 23 months. Some of those could be minimum feeding frequency, minimum acceptable diet, or consumption of iron-rich or iron-fortified food. Another lesson learned is that PDM should also include so all PDMs usually include expenditure tracking, but it would be good to also have within PDMs to be tracking the, the purchase of milk infant formula just to make sure that the cash is not developing negative behavior amongst mothers, not encouraging them to do so, even so more in context of migration where uh, mothers really need to go out and seek income and might be encouraged by the cash to stop breastfeeding.
Another recommendation for nutrition is to further expand the bidirectional referral system model. So as for child protection, we also set up this uh, referral system within nutrition teams. However, it was much more limited than with the child protection. So it's really recommended to first start the IYCF activities at the beginning of the program as part of community mobilization activities so that nutrition staff can better identify households that are with children that are potentially at risk of malnutrition and refer them to the cash team whenever appropriate. On the multipurpose cash, as you saw, the, the profiles of the beneficiaries that were supported by cash were pretty relevant to the objective and the design of the project. So the, the use of the scoring tool was very accurate. The use of the referral system as well was very efficient. It enabled us at a time where we weren't implementing health activities to identify a lot of beneficiaries that were suffering from chronic disease or disabilities, which might not have been possible otherwise. It also enabled us to identify identify cases of at-risk children. However, the problem of this referral system is that it might take a while to set up, especially when first phase responses. So that's also why we decided to mix it with an approach where we're doing scre uh, screening of the settlement, so direct identification. Also, it's recommended as much as possible to include uh, sectorial indicators, even though they're not included in the program objective. So, for example, an indicator on health, an indicator on education, livelihoods, or the protection ones, as mentioned before. This would really, really enable us to better track the multiplier effect of the cash. As we saw, there were various expenditures on education, on health uh, that were not initially planned. So it, it would have been great to also know, aside from the fact that they used the money for, for this, to know as well what, how this has impacted them. In terms of the MEB, so the MEB has been developed in a manner that is not really per capita. So some expenditures like food were per capita, but others weren't. So it's, it's really recommended to tailor as much as possible the MEB to the household size to better meet the needs and also to consider uh, temporality in transfer amount calculation. So more specifically in context where people arrive and don't have things like migration context where you want to provide cooking kits, it's better to provide the entire value of the sleeping kit and cooking kit at, during the first months of assistance rather than breaking it down into for various months. Why? Simply because uh, you cannot buy a quarter of a mattress or a quarter of a plate. You need to make the, this important investment since the beginning so that the impact basically starts sooner rather than later. One last point is that it's also recommended for second phases to start including analyzing the level of income and remittances and to include them into the calculation of the NB to better reflect uh, the household actual economy and expenditure pattern. So I think this is it. Open to questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. First of all, Julia and Nile. this was a great presentation. I want just to say that we have around 20 minutes for questions before we might be kicked out of Zoom. So we'll have to keep it brief. I do really encourage everyone to read the report to has a lot of details that you might be asking now. If you have a question, I'll stop sharing my screen now. If you have a question, do raise your hand and we will unmute. I see already a couple of hands. And then I will also monitor the Q&A section. So bear with me as I try to like respond as many questions as we can. So the first, I'll unmute somebody who is a question. In the presentation, you have said that percentage of parents supporting an improvement in the well-being of their child. That is 63 percent, you said. So what is the percentage of increase? Is there any baseline then? Or from where to where? Before and after, can you say? No, as we mentioned, the indicator that you have seen are indicators that were recommended and published after the program ended. So we didn't include those indicators at baseline stage. We just went back and looked at the data that we had from our case management and within the child protection team uh, to measure uh, those indicators. Okay, thank you. I see there is another hand raised, but I want to give also some answer to the question that I can see. So there are some questions a bit around, like I can try to group them around the meal framework, if you can discuss a bit more about it, and like also say a bit more on how did you assess the reduction in child protection issues that you mentioned. Okay, now over to you on this one. If I um, hear correctly, this question is around the meal framework, right? Yeah, the meal framework and with the, maybe some details on the child protection issue mentioned. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk for the meal framework. So 
basically what we started to do, uh, let me explain first the, the process. With the referral system, once we have someone who is referred to the program, we conduct a registration. Through this registration, we have a certain amount of criteria, a list of criteria that we, we put on a questionnaire and we see if this household will meet the criteria to be participate in the program. And once a household is selected to be participant in the household, we have a group of households. Let's say, for example, this week we have received 100 people referred and we screen them through the registration. And then after that, we select all the people who were selected. Uh, we, we choose all the people who were selected and we apply a baseline questionnaire using a sample. So the baseline value that we provided you in this presentation is calculated using a sample size of the beneficiary that were selected using a selection criteria. And at the end of the program, we conduct an end line using the same questionnaire. However, because we are not doing one-time registration, because we are registering people as they are referred to the program, we have done a unquote, a rolling basis registration and baseline. So that means after even after four months that we started the program, we still continue having people registered and get baseline in the program. So we did like five cohort of baseline registration. And at the end of the program, because we knew exactly when this person started the program, when the, start, the person started receiving cash, so we conduct the three cohorts of end line, so we are able to compare baseline and, and final evaluation. Between the baseline and the final evaluation, we conducted, as Julia said, some PDM, which is the post distribution monitoring, where we asked some question about the use of the cash. And a typical question around the coping strategy index to see how these indicators are moving during the course of the project. So this is in overall what I can give you in terms of a framework for the component. Thanks, yeah. Niall. Uh, and just one question because I didn't hear it and I don't know. Did you use any, it's all something that people are asking, did you use any control group during this project? No, um, this is a really good question. And why we did not use control group? Because, you know, control group, you have a treatment group and your control group. But in the context of emergency, when you select a beneficiary that meet some criteria, it's difficult to decide this person will be part of the control group, meaning this, will, this person will not be part of the, the program or not. So in the context of emergency, applying control group, it has an aspect of obvious that you can apply control group and also apply control group. So we just have the picture, yeah. the baseline. Thank you. So I see somebody else's hand raised and I saw also another question in the chat. So I'll allow to talk, Tabitha, now. Just I want to know, like uh, this, uh, uh, this project that you have presented doesn't have any impact indicators, but the case workers have assessed the child well-being. So based on the experience, of, uh, can I get uh, to know like what are the major uh, child protection risks being identified during the project period and being addressed to this uh, uh, cash transfer project? And uh, based on your experience, uh, do you have any suggestions uh, for impact level indicators to monitor the child protection? Thank you very much. So I'll take part of the question and then I know that there are some other Save the Children colleagues on the line, so please feel free to, to jump in. So in terms of risks identified, those were listed during the presentation at one point. So there were risk of child recruitment, uh, particularly in those areas. There were risks of child labor, child neglect, pretty high risk of uh, sexual abuse and physical violence. So those were the main ones identified and cash had impact on some of the cases that we had identified. I don't know if Maureen, uh, Phoebe are on the call. Yeah, I think those were the key risks. You mentioned the key risks that were identified and that were really transferred, I mean, referred to their cash program and we saw quite an impact in that. 
in these times of COVID and the situation, uh, if this program could be set up very rapidly to respond to increased poverty and vulnerability, and if it is recommended or not. If you're asking about using cash transfers at time of uh, COVID, yes, we are actually scanning up all of our cash operations as much as possible in response to COVID. Given that COVID is really having a massive impact on the economy of the housewives, it prevents them from working and moving around, especially in this context. We're trying to integrate it as much as possible to child protection as well. I don't know if Valérie is on the line and want to comment a bit about uh, our adapt program adaptation to COVID. Okay. Okay. So hi, my name is Valérie Dourdan. I'm the team leader for the response. Yes, we have adapted pretty quickly our programs. So we are now based in four different locations in, in Colombia. And there was a very strong call from the government of Colombia to have cash of as the, the solutions for Venezuelans and Colombian returnees who are, who are uh, in, in difficulties because for over 40% of the economy in Colombia is informal, so people are living from a day-to-day -day paycheck, and also they are staying in a day-to-day -day hotel that they have to pay on a, on a daily basis. So that has become a, a huge burden for, for the, the, the country and, and how to respond, and the best response have been the cash. So we have adapted, so the good thing is our financial provider, which is a kind of Western Union that exists in Colombia, who have 10,000 points that you can get the cash in, in Colombia, have helped us to make more flexible and our donor also have accepted to, flexi uh, to make it flexible. So today we are able to almost do the cash transfer based on the list that we receive from the government without having to see our beneficiaries, but we can almost do everything online and with our service provider. We are able to do over 500 uh, beneficiaries per week in any place in Colombia, again, based on the list that we receive from the government, that we do a, a review by phone of every beneficiaries, and we can do it directly through our service provider without having to, to mobilize the beneficiaries or mobilize a big team and do, just do a check with our service providers. Big flexibility that we have been given by our donor. We have agreements with uh, mayorships and government to be able to do it and to very quickly give the cash to the beneficiaries, which is basically based on the quarantine where we, quarantine where we are at here in Colombia uh, is the program which is working the best for the responses of COVID to, to Venezuelan and Colombian. Over. Thanks a lot, Valérie. And just to comment a little bit on the more technical side, in various places we've adopted different approaches. So, for example, in Colombia, we've decided to couple two, the value of two transfers within one to enable the, the household to better cope with the situation during quarantine. In other contexts, we've decided to add a top-up to our uh, existing transfer to cover the remaining gap. In some places, we also decided to distribute hygiene kits in parallel to the cash transfer in areas where the hygiene kits were not available on the market and couldn't be purchased through the cash. And then two final questions, which I think are quick to answer. One is like, if you saw any tension between people who received the cash and didn't receive cash, and if you had an influx of people actually requesting more cash. And then if you, there was any parenting specific component attached in the child protection activity. In terms of integration of lessons learned, we have expanded our current program to, to new areas. We've continued, implemented the good practices that we have learned from this program. We have started uh, further expanding our nutrition activities as per recommendations prior to, to entering into new areas. We have also further uh, reinforced our partnerships with co-authorities working specifically on uh, cases of, uh, of child protection and on uh, nutrition initiatives. Um, and we are currently working very closely with some of those institutions to better understand the, the legal framework around provision of cash to unaccompanied minors. I wouldn't necessarily call them tensions, but, but of course there were some uh, challenges with individuals that weren't selected for the program that uh, tried to understand why. We had to, in response to this, we had to really, really strengthen our community feedback mechanisms and community outreach. So we're speaking with community leaders leaders to better explain and sensitize individuals on the, the program objective, the program targets. And that really, really helped throughout the project to uh, reduce those, those challenges and, and tensions. Thanks. 
Um, I guess last question, and we can take one more after this that was asked was around the parenting skills. I don't know who can answer if there was any specific activities around parenting in, built into this project. I'll take that, Eleonora, Phoebe here. We, the main priority, I mean, starting point, we started with child safeguarding. Safeguarding training is to everyone in the team. And then after that, we moved to integrating it into our, our management activities. And then because we had referrals back and forth from the cash team and the child protection teams, we had, through our community mobilization teams, we had a, session, a series of trainings. And most of our beneficiaries used to attend those trainings. And part of it used uh, a part of the training used to have positive parenting uh, bits of it. So yes, there's a component of that in part of the activities. Yeah. Thanks, Phoebe, for that. Um, one last question, if anybody wants to raise their hand and ask a final question before we close. I think there was an interesting question about adolescents. If you were dealing with any adolescents as head of household, just because this adolescent topic is always coming up. So I don't know if you face this in your program. So in the program, we didn't provide cash to underage children. The reason for it is that there is a very specific legal framework in Colombia that we are currently, we are currently working on the, the local services to better understand it and see whether cash for minors would be possible and appropriate within that framework. Phoebe, do you want to complement this? Yeah, just to complement that a lot of adolescents used to receive the support were attached to caregivers. So we didn't have uh, children who are on their own receiving, identified who are receiving the cash. 